Greetings, family. I am Dr. Ali Muhammad, current acting chief of the Aboriginal Republic of North America. I've come to you to make this short video as an introduction to nationality so that members of the community can understand our plebiscite. Our plebiscite was put together for the sole purpose of dealing with the genocide and the denationalization of the so-called Negro, African American. What we have done is we have formed the only indigenous government that exclusively brings our people into the fold of their proper status as Aboriginal Americans of Moorish descent. When we say Aboriginal Americans, what we mean is that we are the first people on this land by lineage, which is just sanguinous. Just sanguinous means rights by bloodline. The so-called Omex, also known properly as the She, are the oldest people in North America. When we look at the history of North America, we study the um, languages, etymology of the lexicons, the anthropology, the pyramid building. What we find out is that these ancient civilizations were built, constructed, operated by ancient black races. And the use of the term Omec, which is a misnomer, misnomer meaning it's not the original name, gives us the information that we need to understand our place in ancient American history. When we look at the Olmec cosmology and their description of their own origins, they talk of themselves as a people who are Aboriginal, autochthonous, which means that they were always here on the soil. They never described themselves as coming from any other particular land. So as we look at the context and the history and the culture of indigenous peoples on this landmass, we have to reconstruct old ideologies that are based purely on myth, such as the out of Africa theory, where all black people or all people of uh, ancestry of the primal race or primal stock all originated on one continent. These things do not match the original records of original people. So what we are saying is that we are propelling a plebiscite to tie back to the two locations prior to the transatlantic slave trade that we know our lineage comes from. And that is the ancient Aboriginal races of the Americas and the ancient peoples of Western al Kibalan, also known as West Africa. In the ancient annals of Tacitus of the Roman Empire, Tacitus describes the Roman invasion of a group of people who are called the Moors and the Musulami. Moors and the Musulami existed over 800 years prior to the advent of those Moors and Muslims who came from Arabia to assist their brothers and sisters with going back up into Europe and restabilizing old locations. So we have to rewrite history altogether to get a better perception of who we are. So when we use the term Moors, the Moors or the Moorish descent, the Moorish descent and the Moorish bloodlines are the peoples of Western al Kibalan, with many different clan names during that particular period. As we look at the context in which we want to speak on nationality, we're exclusively speaking on just solely and just sanguinous. Just solely means rights by soil, being born in a particular location and having the ability to name that location based on tradition. And just sanguinous deals with rights by bloodline. Rights by bloodline are rights from your mother and your father based on their true nationality. We do know that the Negro and the African American experience what we legally and lawfully call denationalization. Denationalization is the process by which one loses their political identity. Genocide is the process by which a people are killed, maimed, generally have uh, the, uh, their ability to exist as a nation, a religion, an ethnic group deprived from them under some illegal process. So we do know that the Moors made treaties with the Europeans and our ancestors when they made these treaties um, with the Europeans made protections because we were at war with them. Those treaties still exist to this day. So much so that many of our early thought, uh, many of our early founders of the ideology of remedy for our people like Edward, Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden advocated our people going back to Western al Kibalan, so-called Africa, and forming an Islamic state. This is, in the, this is in the 1800s that this was being advocated. And many of the later people who came along, like the great Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Prophet Nobu Ali, 
the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and many others before then were advocating an Islamic identity for us because they understood the history. In fact, it was in the 1890s when the Moorish Zionist Temple first brought the language of discussing the Moorish Asiatic presence in Western uh, al Kibalan and our connection to those particular things. So we have this history written for us of our indigenous heritage in North America and our ancient Islamic or ancient Moorish heritage that sprung from the Nile Valley civilizations and descended all the way down to the later Islamic civilizations, which were only the child of those Nile Valley civilizations. What we are advocating is our people understand this lineage in the legal sense and the lawful sense and advocate remedy in 2007, the United Nations, 144 nations within the United Nations, advocated all indigenous peoples had the right to remedy and reparation for the injury of colonization. When we look at the international laws and the things that have been proposed through resolutions through other nations, they are only assisting others, such as ourselves, at going through the process of self-identification and manning up and womaning up into a position to advocate nationhood for ourselves after denationalization and colonization. So when we look at these things, what we can understand is that the actions are very practical. If we want to build a good economic base, what better way to do it than understanding that if we are in the capacity of our indigenous status, then we are afforded a non-obligation to taxes or tax exemption. When we look at the U.S. Constitution in the international format, what we will find out is that indigenous peoples were not subject to tax because they were not citizens. So as we still have the ability to interface by commerce, to interface commercially, what we do need to understand is that we can put ourselves in our right cultural status and it has a synchronization with building economic wealth. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the United States Constitution advocates to all indigenous peoples that they should operate as uh, tax exempt uh, in their tax exempt uh, status. So as we look at this and we look at the true nationality of the so-called Negro African American, we have to tie these lines of the Aboriginal Americans and the Moorish descent together. And this has been done for the first time under the, uh, under the government of the Aboriginal Republic of North America. What we are saying is that we have combed through American history and we can see the real picture of what really happened to our people. Even with the design of the original American flag, which is 13 stripes, 13 stars in a circle, and was the first flag discussed in the journals of the Continental Congress and advocated by the so-called founding fathers of Europeans. That particular flag, when we study it and look at the wording inside of the journals of the Continental Congress, was said to represent a new constellation. Through our history, we have been able to gather the information to prove that the early founding fathers studied the ancient Zolkin calendar system of the Aboriginal Americans on the eastern seaboard of North America. When the first European explorers, Giovanni de Verrazzano of Italy, came to the eastern seaboard of the Americas, he described the people as looking like Ethiopians. And this lost heritage amongst the Aboriginals that has been lost is being re-implemented. We are building the institutions and the educational systems to assist ourselves at understanding what our particular status is. Our particular status is that we have our own government as Aboriginal Americans of Moorish descent under the Aboriginal Republic of North America. And we participate as U.S. nationals under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. And what that means is we are interfacing as non-citizens whose ancestors have had a particular link to having particular periods of allegiance for their own freedom. When our people fought in the Civil War, they were not citizens, they were aliens, and they were fighting for their own freedom. In 1868, 144 years ago, a group of people who were of European descent came together and decided to make us an offer to become subject citizens. And we have the option to either accept that or not accept that. The line that is drawn between us accepting it or not is our own decision based on our own level of knowledge that we have about our own history. So we need to understand that we have a powerful ability to understand, to implement, and to advocate indigenous government for our peoples under the jurisdiction of the Aboriginal Republic of North America and under the nationality as Aboriginal Americans of Moorish descent. 
Our constitution is available at www.indigenousgovernment.org. In that constitution, you can read all 13 articles and understand every aspect of government from the Declaration of Rights of the Nationals who are part of it, all the way down to the operations of the ministerial parliaments and to the chief executive. That constitution is written there for the public's viewing and for the national study. As we move forward and understand jurisdiction, we understand that there are many components to the jurisdiction. The constitution for honor is one component. The just solely and just saying with its rights and understanding it is another component. Having an official government and a structure is another component. Having historical precedents as an indigenous government. The only two types of governments that can exist on this land, one being the United States of America, the other being any indigenous governments. So we find many indigenous governments, the Navajo, all right, the Blackfoot, all right, the Pequot, all right, and we fall within that realm as the Shi and Amaru, who are the most ancient uh, clans on this particular continent. So as we look at those particular things, and we understand that we are indigenous, we are autochthonous, our histories never said we came from anywhere else, and we also understand that there was a merging of the bloodlines pre-colonization and post-colonization of the peoples of Western al -Kibalan. then we know why when we take a DNA test and our DNA comes back matching the jaw off. We understand why those matches are made, all right? And we can continue to go through the history and comb through the history and study and understand what exactly happened in the transatlantic slave trade. According to the transatlantic <coughs> slave trade database, there were only 420,000 so-called slaves brought from Western al -Kibalan. And those 420,000 slaves were mainly brought from the Ivory Coast and the areas of Senegambia and other places. We do know from studying the history that the Oyo Kingdom, the Dahomey Kingdom, the Kingdom of Ouida, the Kingdom of the Congo, and the Kingdom of Angola participated in wars and allied, allied with the Europeans to enslave those who were in the various Islamic or Moorish polities. We wrote about this in our book, The Lost Aboriginal Heritage of the So-Called Negro African American, Resolving a Historical, Political, and Economic Identity Crisis. And in writing that material, our specific uh, intent was to show the political backdrop of what happened to us in the so-called slave trade. It was the Arabs, the Europeans, and some tribal Africans who attacked the Islamic polities and many or most of the slaves who came in the slave trade were a part of those particular polities. I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and I went to Charleston several times to see the largest slave port in the history. Austin and Lorenz was the largest slaving company in the 18th century, and they gathered only about 30,000 slaves, which itself is a lot, and we really hurt, but we need to understand the backdrop, the actual backdrop, to understand that the numbers have been fluffed and we need to understand the connection between the peoples of Western al kibalan and the peoples of ancient America. As we move through and understand that we have a flag now, we have a constitution, and as we look at that flag and we look at the Star and Crescent, we know and understand that the Shi or the Olmec were the designers of the original Star and Crescent, who, when they designed the flag or designed the contents which went into the flag, it represented something astronomically the connections or the astro uh, conjunctions between the planet Venus and the planet Earth. In the Shi cosmology, the planet Earth and the planet Venus went through a catastrophic event many, many millennia ago. The, the ancestor Ishkel represented the uh, science of birth, and she is placed in the crescent as a symbol of the planet Venus. So when we look at the star and crescent, by concept and tradition, it was formulated in ancient Mesoamerica, and the Manzil calendar eventually spread to the east, into places like Sumeria, Kemet, and ancient uh, Sindh or Hindustan. <clears throat> so those various civilizations of ancient antiquity carried a tradition that was actually originated in the Americas. And this ancient Manzil calendar is the reason why you see this flag behind me, the black flag with the star and crescent, representing an ancient cosmological tradition. So as we look at that flag, we understand it represents nation, and it represents a people who have stood up 
to participate in a plebiscite to gather that culture and to gather themselves in a self-organized government. As we go further and we look at how are we going to continue to build, one of the things that we work on is getting encumbrances away from the people. Encumbrances means debt. And what we have found is that the so-called slave trade became the bedrock of economy for the Europeans who were invading our lands. And as we look at this, we understand that the whole bond market started with the slave trade. And the concept was turn people into property. That has been accelerated today. And what we take and partake in is the removal of ourselves from those adverse encumbrances and debts through studying economics. One of the things that we study is called the Committee on the Uniform Security Identification Procedures, also called QCEP. QCEP is made so that we, you could have a party that could participate in something called securitization. And securitization is basically the ability to take people who do not know how to contract and to get them into fraudulent quasi-contracts against the premise of rights, against the premise of the laws of contract, the meeting of the minds, and against the premise of justice in carrying out interface commercially. So this is all done under our own ignorance, and we participate in financial recovery to assist ourselves and avail ourselves of the necessary information so that we will not participate in these fraudulent contracts. So when people come into our society, we have our own documents, we have our own <coughs> procedure for recording their manifestation into this world or their birth. We do not use birth certificates. We do not use sovereign citizen ideology. We do not claim UCC1s on birth certificates or any of these other erroneous concepts. There's only two things that we do. We operate in a civic government and we operate commercial protection of that government. And that is the civilized thing to do. Many of the people who are interested in nationality, we have to take a backdrop into understanding the culture before we get engaged in commercial operations. And then we will understand how to participate in government. All of the offices of government in the United States of America have a fiduciary duty. That fiduciary duty is to enforce the Constitution, to support and defend it. And their oaths of office are on record. So although we are not citizens, and although we did not participate in the writing of the Constitution, as Moors or as indigenous people, we did add to the content and the culture. And we do have an international interface based on treaties. We were the first people to translate the Treaty of Marrakesh also called mistakenly the Treaty of Morocco, which our ancestors made in 1786 as a grant to the United States of protection after a war with them. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson later advocated not paying tribute to the Barbary powers and initiated with other European powers the Barbary Wars. The Barbary Wars are code word for wars with the peoples of Western al Kibalan, also known as Muslims or Moors. So as we look at these particular things, and we understand the dynamics by which we are building both indigenous government and tying back into our Moorish heritage, our Islamic heritage, with the exclusive understanding that that heritage ties back to the ancient Cushitic or ancient Nile Valley civilizations, then we can now come to our people with a formulation of a plan that can help them in their health, that can help them in their economy, that can help them in their legal operations, that can help them in setting up uh, their court systems. We have done all of these things to assist our people as a bedrock and a base for us to decide whether we want to continue to stay in America and operate and have a civil uh, interface with the United States of America or whether we want to re-embrace our brothers on the continent to find a place and a home for ourselves. So this project within the Aboriginal Republic of North America is one, to re-establish your culture. Your culture is the natural law systems of the universe. Any religion not rooted in the universal order of things is of no good to a people. We are a people who are direct descendants of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And our traditions all over the planet have proven that we are a people who are peaceful by nature. Our only will is to have an ability to thrive and an ability to sustain our lineage on this planet without facing genocide. We are adverse to no one and protective of everyone who is walking in the line of justice. That is our will culturally. Our will culturally is to unite our people beyond the superficial understandings of their culture into the substantive understandings of their culture. Secondly, we want to operate indigenous government in an autonomous fashion. Autonomous means that we have every component 
of operation that we need to sustain our people. And we are looking for assistance from no one. Our assistance will come from the nationals implementing and investing in their, into their society. And lastly, we want to build economy. Economy is understanding resources, whether it's agricultural, whether it's investment uh, circles, whatever it may be. We want to rebuild the original families, which participated in protecting every man, woman, and child on the planet so that we can have a people who have the ancient respect and dignity of the past. All of our problems, from police brutality, from crime, from the decaying public infrastructures in the United States of America, can be solved by us coming together as a government to operate these things for the betterment of our lineage. My name is Dr. Ali Muhammad. I am signing off on behalf of the Aboriginal Republic of North America. Come visit us at www.indigenousgovernment.org, www.indigenouscourtsonline.org, www.indigenouslandinvestments.com, www.aboriginalglobalmedia.com. And if you need to reach Dr. Ali Muhammad, you can contact me at www.dralimuhammad.com or www.aboriginalmedicalassociation.org. Those are all of our contacts, our online contacts. And if you need to contact us, our numbers, our fax numbers, and all of the things that are there are available for us. I just want to say in the name of the Creator and the ancestors that we will continue to strive to work to better help our people become a nation. One nationality, one aim, one destiny.